I wanted you to understand before Stephen comes up is that the, the world he's championing, and he's, he's one of the noted authorities in this field, the jeopardy takes intellectually and career-wise in taking that posture. It go, it, it's, it's more fundamental than just the theological implication. So for what it's worth, I want to introduce a dear friend, Stephen Meyer. I'm glad to have had this help from three tech-savvy gentlemen here. Um, when, when I was a college professor, I taught a course in the history and philosophy, or history of science and technology, and the students got a gig, big kick out of my inability to operate the VCR. So this is, uh, <laughs> anyway, I am very glad to be with you all. Uh, Chuck and I met years ago when I was a college professor at Whitworth University in Spokane. And I have to tell you, I, my first meeting, I, I'd long admired him because of his, uh, his really provocative and interesting and insightful Bible uh, teaching. I used to listen to them going back and forth to grad school in England. One of them, I listened to one of his series over the, I was somewhere over the pole and it just absolutely blew my mind. I couldn't stop thinking about it until we landed in Heathrow. So it's, uh, when I, but when I first met Chuck, um, I, I, I was kind of prepared to be disappointed because I'd met a lot of people that I'd admired from a distance before, and then sometimes you have that kind of deflating experience that they're a little full of themselves and, and, and not what you'd hoped. And uh, Chuck and I were at a you know, modest restaurant in Spokane. He came to meet me over in the valley there. And uh, we got talking right away, jabbering about all these matters of information sciences. But at a certain point in the conversation, he stops and he says, well, so how can I help you? You're on an important mission. And I, it was just very disarming. I thought uh, he, was, he was so uh, supportive and encouraging. And so it's, it's really great from, from my point of view to be back with you, or to be back with him and to see what a wonderful turnout for this conference. Um, I was not only a professor at Whitworth College, but I was um, a student as well. And when I was a student, I was uh, majoring in, in physics and in geology, but I had this problem in that, in that I was interested in the big questions that go beyond science as well, what you might call the philosophical questions. My father had a big influence on me. He, like Chuck, was an engineer, and uh, he gave me some advice when I was leaving for college. He said, look, you don't have to be an engineer like I am. You can choose any major you want, but I would advise you to take two years of college math before you choose a major. And I said, yeah, okay. He said, well, the reason for that is that if you don't have the math, you're going to be limited. So take the two years of college math. Well, in those days, Whitworth was small enough that if you took two years of college math, the only thing you could major in when you were done was physics, which is, I think, what my dad wanted. <laughs> that was as close to mechanical engineering as you know, we could get. In, in any case, um, I, I'm in my junior and senior year, and I couldn't, we had a terrific philosophy professor at Whitworth that I we had a huge influence on my life. His name was Norman Krebs. And he taught terrific, uh, these amazing courses on worldview, uh, philosophy, and, and putting them in a big picture context. How many, by the way, are familiar with the term worldview? Uh, very uh, obviously, it's chaos, right? Okay. So, uh, but I used to define a worldview for my students as a personal philosophy that you might have, whether you know you have one or not, or um, a set of basic answers to a, a set of more or less coherent answers to some of the basic questions. Questions like, what's the thing or entity from which everything else comes? So I was interested in those big questions, and so I was always sneaking across campus to take philosophy courses. And uh, in my junior and senior year, I can't remember which, I was taking a course in atheistic existentialism. Nietzsche and Sartre and all the depressing atheists, and I was, do, I was excelling in this course. I was wallowing in existential despair. And I... I <laughs> It, it was very popular in the late 70s, and I was good at it. And uh, so my grade slip comes home, and somehow my dad, we're some of Germanic background, and you know, dad still intercepts those things, and you're, you're a senior in college. And uh, so he wants to have a little conversation with me about it. So the grade, he starts reading the grades, and he, he mangles for effect the words atheistic exa... He says, what in the blank is atheistic existentialism? And then he reads the grade, and it says an A. And then he reads the next grade, and it's theoretical mechanics, my most important physics course of the term. And there was a long pause, and the word comes out, B. And then he looks down his glasses, and I know I'm supposed to give an explanation, you know. So I start to say, well, Dad, 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 look, you know, I, I know you don't think the philosophy really matters, and the, it's only the science, but you really need to understand philosophy because it's very important because it helps you understand people's worldviews. And worldviews are important because they really are, they help you understand where people are coming from. And it, because if you don't have an understanding of people's worldviews, and he cuts me off, he says, son, you don't need a worldview. 
you need a job. <laughs> 